Hey everybody, welcome back to another new video. Uh, today I wanted to take a look at my vimrc and uh, my dot vim directory. Uh, before we go ahead and do that though, uh, I thought we'd, it'd be a good idea to focus just a little bit on what makes my vimrc a bit different uh, than some others you might see online and you know maybe interesting for a certain type of user. Uh, the first and most obvious point to bring up is that I'm not really a programmer at all. Uh, I have one little series on my YouTube channel where I'm trying to build uh, my personal website with HTML and CSS uh, and like an even smaller set of videos messing around with uh, some a little bit of bash scripting. I of course discovered Vim uh, during those brief experiences with uh, different types of programming and uh, you know messing around on the command line where knowing how to make a quick edit in Vim or Nano or even Emacs makes your time a whole lot easier. But on a daily basis the vast majority of what I do is just standard plain Jane writing, the kind of thing that I used to use Microsoft Word or Google Docs for in high school, and most recently I would use something like Ulysses or uh, Typora for. When I reach for my laptop, there's about a 50-50 chance that I'm either going to open up a writing app or After Effects, and it's been that way for years and years. Um, now, of course, whenever I started using Vim, it became like incredibly frustrating to use one of these standard sort of markdown writing apps. Uh, just Vim has this incredible, wildly efficient way of editing and manipulating and navigating text that you just really can't get in any of these sort of standard writing apps. So that's really the focus when it comes to my VimRC. Uh, I'm primarily focused on making just plain writing as comfortable and efficient as possible. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that I've gone through like some amount of grief to make sure that Vim stays as lightweight and sort of minimalistic as possible, apart from the, you know, wickedly efficient movement and editing key bindings. The most attractive thing about Vim for me is the, frankly, just absurd launch time. There are files that I have that I routinely edit that are, you know, let's see here, well over 180,000 words, even larger than that sometimes. I mean, look at this. This is a one megabyte file here that is just text. Do you know how much plain text you have to have in a file to hit a one megabyte of plain text? I mean, that's huge. That's larger than most books. That's a, a huge, a huge file. That's a huge file size. And the thing about it is Vim is able to open up this file just as quickly as you would open a one line file. That's incredible. Um, so I'm not really going to do anything to try to get in the way of that. If Vim can do something on its own built in, I'm not going to try to add a plugin just because maybe it can do it a bit better. Uh, but anyways, let's go ahead and maybe take a look at how this works. Starting of course with the actual plugins that I do have installed. Uh, the first of which is my plugin manager. I use um, Vim plug. Uh, Vim plug is a pretty handy uh, plugin manager and the thing is this is probably the one place where I break the rule I just set up you don't need a plugin manager for vim uh, there's nothing wrong with just like doing a git pull into your dot vim directory to install any plugins you want that's fine but plugin managers generally very lightweight and make updating and stability way way easier there's no chance that you're gonna have to you're supposed to put one thing in one directory and you just don't or you didn't know the plugin manager will handle it all for you it will handle updates all for you and vim plug is a really great one you can install it really easily with one line here in any command line and then you're all set to go once you're inside of vim and you have vim plug installed there's just a few little commands that you use to do everything uh plug clean will clean out things after you've deleted a few apps plug install is what you use to install plugins and then we've got plug update and plug upgrade to update the actual pl vim plug application and all of the additional plugins that you've installed uh, now speaking of things that aren't necessarily necessary we have this right down here this is a status bar for vim um, by default when you open up vim you get none of that uh, you get a blank vim and when you start adding text it's like the simplest text editor you'll ever see there. No statistics anywhere, no, no notifications. There's not even a spell check by default. You have to turn that on yourself. But what I found is that it's very handy to have just a little bit of information at your disposal. And I think Airline for Vim is one of those plugins, that's the status bar that I use, that does this pretty well. We have just a few little pieces of information. We've got a little indicator here that will tell us what mode we're in. We can cycle between the different modes and it'll sort of update and let us know. Uh, we have some other stuff that'll tell us what file type we're editing. Um, you know, right now we're editing a Vim file. If I were to open up something like a markdown file, 
we'll get that instead. It'll tell us the encoding that we're using UTF-8. And then we have a few simple things. We've got a word count, which is handy. We have a percentage indicator that'll tell us where we are in the document. And then a line slash column indicator. Um, if we move through the document, it'll tell us what line we're on at all times. And as we move over through a line, it'll tell us what column we're on or you know what character we're on, what, however you want to phrase that. Um, one other thing I have installed is this other plugin, uh, Vim Airline Themes. This is just a cool plugin that picks up a lot of the themes that you would commonly use in Vim and allows them to work with the airline status bar down here. So if I were to change my color scheme, our status bar will change along with that without us having to go into the Vim RC and make any sort of changes. We can just on the fly change our theme while we're using Vim and the status bar will update. So that's that's very, very handy. Now, speaking of the status bar, one other thing that I wanna take a look at is this cool plugin called Goyo. As we mentioned, the first time that we open up Vim uh, with any kind of file. We get basically nothing. Vim on its own is basically the simplest text editor in the world. And the thing is, that's actually pretty attractive. That's, that's a nice feature. And so what I have next up is a plugin that's going to sort of emulate that. This is a plugin called Goya. As you can see, it gets rid of all the fluff. This is there by default. Gets rid of the status bar gets rid of any indicators that would be there and just sort of moves everything to the center. It gives us a slightly uh, more narrow uh, view to look at. Of course, you can easily change that view. Um, you know, if you want it to be a bit wider, that's definitely something you can do. Uh, but it also turns on syntax, leaves on spell checking and anything like that that you have set up. So that's incredibly, incredibly useful. This is a great plugin. Um, and if you use it a lot, you can do something that I've done, which is right down here, I've set up some custom key bindings uh, that allow me to quickly trigger Goyo with a keyboard shortcut, which in my case is Control G. Um, I also even have a secondary shortcut built in for Control H because I, I very often like a slightly wider window to edit text in depending on uh, how I'm working. And then the final uh, like real plugin that I have installed is just something called Git Gutter. Um, for that, let's uh, add a couple of lines here. Um, this is a version controlled file here, my, my VimRC. And I'm just reopening the application because the Git Gutter takes a second to pop up. Uh, but if you just reload the file, you'll have no issue. But you can see pretty clearly what's happening here. We get a little indicator on the side of our Vim window that's just gonna tell us what's going on as far as version controls and so on. You can see I've added a whole bunch of new lines here. If I remove a line, we'll get a little minus sign there, an indicator. And this may seem kind of dumb, but when you're editing a file, I've found it incredibly helpful to just have this little status bar here telling me what chunks of the document have been edited thus far. It's very easy to get back to changes that you've made with this little status bar here. I find it incredibly, incredibly handy. It's super, super easy. The next thing that I have up are just a few little syntax files. Um, as I mentioned, the main thing that I'm competing with in terms of my Vim configuration are two applications. First up is this Typora or Ulysses or IA writer, any of those good, simple markdown writing apps. I'm a big, big fan of those. And I mean, there's not really anything else to say about it. A good markdown writing app is, is sort of its own ad. And the other thing that I'm competing with is Slugline. This is my screenwriting app of choice. It's incredibly, incredibly simple. It uses the fountain screenwriting format, which is basically just markdown for screenplays. There is no real syntax that you need to memorize. Uh, it's you write a scene heading and it knows that it's a scene heading. You write an action description, it knows it's an action description. You write a character, name it knows his character name and then you're immediately writing dialogue you can jump into parentheticals below it it's a very very smart app and it, it works sort of based on the fact that the actual technical language for screenwriting is incredibly incredibly simple but also well defined basically all this syntax that you need to know for writing a screenplay in fountain format is surrounding italics with one asterisk surrounding bold with two asterisks and then using the greater than sign to do a transition. And that's it. So this is a great screenwriting app. Uh, but the problem with Vim is that by default, neither Markdown or Fountain are really officially supported. And it's certainly not like the main draw of people who are developing Vim color schemes. You know, most of these people are programmers. Uh, so we sort of have to add Markdown and Fountain support. That's pretty straightforward. It's not going to be incredibly complicated. Um, one other thing that we have here is an application that adds colors to CSS. Uh, selectors, uh, anytime you're editing a CSS document, 
uh, this app will sort of generate the color that you type in, whether it's hexadecimal or an RGB value or anything. It's incredibly handy to be able to see the color that you're working with right there on the page. You can see a little sample of it. It'll just add a highlight over the value that you've typed in. That's super handy. And then we've just got a couple of color schemes. Uh, Grovebox is sort of my favorite. I use it all the time, uh, but there are of course other others that I use. Uh, one of these other ones here is Tinder. That's a pretty nice looking one. Uh, we have one called One Dark. That's fine. And actually, if I were to quickly go into my uh, my Vim directory, you can see I actually have a ton of different color schemes that I've added, just dropped into the Vim directory. You know, I, like I said, I do a lot of writing, and so it's it's nice to be able to have. A little change of scenery you know to be able to just be writing and then very quickly change color scheme to something a bit different when i've been looking at the same thing for a while that's incredibly incredibly handy and now we get to the actual settings that we're controlling uh the first of which we're just setting the default encoding for vim at utf8 uh by default i believe it works like that but you know whatever and then we have uh file type and we're enabling plugins and indentation wow i just noticed a little error we don't need to enable it up here and down here so we can delete that uh, and then of course we have syntax turned on uh, if we were to turn syntax off for example it's pretty basic what it'll do um, you just have to enable it by default in vim it's sort of turned off uh, then we have auto read and wild menu this is cool you may have seen whenever i swapped color schemes a couple of times i'm just hitting tab to go through the different options that we have that's not the way that vim works by default but it does have that functionality i i have no clue why this isn't turned on by default and then of course we're just setting relative numbers rather than standard line numbers if you notice whenever i go through a page uh whatever line i'm on will print the current line number and then as we go up or down from the current line it will just sort of count. Uh, and that's really easy because let's say I want to delete down to the bottom of this row. I don't have to count or guess. I can just say like 14, delete those lines, and I'm done. That makes that sort of thing really easy. I've heard some people arguing that you know, you don't really need that and who knows, maybe, uh, but whatever, it, it works very handy for me. Um, the other thing that we have here that you maybe not, not won't see in everyone's option is I have a uh, spell check turned on by default. And one thing I've done that's a bit interesting is if you check out this command here, set spell, that's all you need to do to have spell check turned on by default. Uh, if you go into a vanilla Vim window and you just type in set spell, it'll turn spell checking on. But what you'll see is this line right above here, set spell language equals was E-N-U-S and then D-E-D-E. -D -E. So the story there, so I'm trying to learn German a little bit and uh, I just find learning a new language a whole lot easier if you can type out the language. So I wanted spell checking for German and for English and it turns out that was incredibly, 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 incredibly easy to do. Uh, you just look up the language codes for Vim. That's pretty easy information to get a hold of. And whenever you set up this command, uh, it will go ahead and download a new dictionary for that language and you're all set. So now if I'm typing inside of Vim, whether I'm typing in English or whether I'm typing in German, it knows what I'm saying. So that's pretty handy to be able to do. Uh, and then we have a few other things just to set up like tab width. Uh, I like my tab width at four rather than two. I don't know what Vim's default is. It's been a while since I even looked at it, but that's very handy. That's sort of what all of these will do. One other thing we have here are a few little lines here, uh, set HLS, IS, and set IC. Uh, what this is doing is that when we search for words, uh, it will highlight as we search and it will remain highlighted after we've completed the search. That's super basic stuff. It's right there in Vim Tutor whenever you're working with it. And then the last thing here that's sort of just general settings is we have the command height and the last status height. Uh, basically, the way that this works is if we were to set command height. Um, equals, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 or something. This area where we type commands will be quite large and we can, and, and sometimes it's helpful to have a bit more space down there, but I don't really like it. I just like a very small space. Uh, next up, we have one little uh, Vim command here. Uh, all this is saying is that anytime you open a buffer, whether you're reading a file or creating a new file, if it has a dot fountain extension, we're going to use the fountain file type. Um, um, that's something that you just have to do with the specific fountain um, syntax file that I'm using this plugin. Those plugins are a little less well developed than, you know, for example, like the markdown uh, syntax highlighting that we're using, but you know, whatever. If you're interested in editing screenplays inside of Vim, 
Well, that one little line will help you out a lot. Uh, and then finally, we have just a few other little things here. I'll jump down to the bottom and you can see I just have my color scheme by default set to Grovebox. Uh, by default, I have the airline theme set to Grovebox. And then I have one other line that tells Vim to use 256 bit color. That's all just color preference stuff. That's no big deal. Uh, and then finally I have a control set background dark. Uh, and that's because a lot of the themes that I use actually have multiple themes installed. Grovebox is actually one that has a light theme. So by default, I just make sure that Vim knows to always use a dark background. And then the final thing that I want to take a look at, we have a few key remappings. Um, I've already talked about the Goyo remapping that I did. Basically the way that you create a, a key map inside of Vim is you would do map and then you're going to put in the shortcut here and then you would add in the actual command that you want to trigger with that shortcut and then you just close it up with CR, sort of like a closing tag. One that we can take a look at here is uh, this shortcut. All it does is every time I press control eight, so a capital C is control inside of this Vim language, um, dash U, I think it's said H earlier, but it's control U is the keyboard shortcut. Uh, it's going to run the command source slash my vimrc. So all that does is basically if I were to, let's say change this setting in my vimrc and then change the colors, I could run source my vimrc and it will basically just refresh with the vimrc, the new vimrc. So we talked about Goyo. Um, there's basically two other commands that I want to take a look at. The first of which is I've remapped the arrow keys to resize any window. You can see this working down here with the uh, command status bar thing here. Um, but if I were to open up a V split or something, you can see that now my arrow keys are actually resizing the window. And then the final thing I want to talk about is an app called Lex. What this is, is essentially just a replacement for this app that a lot of people use, it's called Nerdtree. This is a file explorer that sort of li lives inside of him. And then if you add an exclamation point to the end of it, it will open up a window over here and then we can browse through whatever directory we're in and find files that we want to open up. Uh, it will stay open even after we found the file, which that's incredibly handy. Uh, but one thing that I don't like is that it opens in a sort of a standard split so what I always find myself wanting to do is just do a vertical resize um, down to like 30 is a really good size for this, I feel like, you know, just a very narrow window where we can see just enough of the files to navigate and open files. So all I've done is I've just mapped both of those to keyboard shortcuts, control N to open up uh, this file explorer, just because that's sort of the standard uh, keyboard shortcut that's recommended with nerd tree, which I did use for a while. And then control B just because it's right next to N uh, to very quickly resize that. And then I can browse through my files the same way that any file explorer would let you. So that's that. Highly recommend you check out Vim. And if you do, uh, hopefully some of these tips have been helpful for you. Uh, thank you everyone for watching the video and I will see you in the next one.